Speaking of nuclear power, Pakistan is expanding its nuclear arsenal. Even as the citizens struggle for basic necessities, Islamabad, or should I say Rawalpindi, is chasing a bigger nuclear stockpile. A new report is out, and it is revealing. It looks into Pakistan's nuclear program and how it is being steadily ramped up. More warheads are being added. The military is getting more delivery systems, also new launch facilities. Tonight, we'll bring you all the details. How many nuclear warheads does Pakistan have? At least 170, 170. <clears throat> the highest number ever. In 2018, Pakistan had 150 warheads. In 2020, they added 10. And in three years, they've added another 10. So you could say Pakistan's arsenal is growing at a faster pace. In the past four years, they've added some 20 warheads. This expansion should worry neighbors like India. It has certainly taken experts by surprise. You see, in 1999, the US had made a projection. They said that by the year 2020, Pakistan would have 60 to 80 warheads. 60 to 80 by 2020. Look at the current number, 170. That's more than twice the estimate. And it won't end here. Pakistan's stockpile could grow further. That's what a new projection says. That they're aiming for 200 warheads. And they could get there by the end of this decade. If Pakistan keeps producing at the current pace, they will have 200 warheads by the end of this decade. And Rawalpindi is trying to make sure that happens. It is building more infrastructure. There are facilities that can enrich uranium. What is the current production rate? Experts believe Pakistan can build 14 to 27 warheads every year. How is that even possible? To answer that, we must first tell you about fissile material. It's like lighting a matchstick. When you strike on a rough surface, a matchstick lights up. Now imagine there are other matchsticks lined up close. One flame will end up igniting all of them. And that's what fissile material does in a nuclear bomb. When a nuclear weapon is fired, the fissile material starts a reaction. It releases massive amounts of energy, and this finally leads to an explosion. Usually two kinds of materials are used for this. Plutonium-239 and Ukrainium-235. Uranium-235. They make the nuclear bomb. And they make the bomb work. They fuel the bomb. Reports say Pakistan is now making enough of these materials, and that is how they can accelerate warhead production. But having a warhead is not enough. You need somewhere to fire it from, and Pakistan is making strides in that department too. We have a breakup for you. First, let's talk about the land-based systems. Pakistan has at least six of them. It plans to add at least two more. They're believed to be in development. Next, we have the garrisons. This is where they're, be, they're believed to be keeping their nukes in garrisons. And how many garrisons does Pakistan have? At least five. We have the names. Akro, Gujranwala, Khuzdar, Pano Akil, and Sargoda. These are the names of the garrisons. Two of them are in northern Pakistan. Three are in the south. What about air power? Pakistan has four air bases. This is where they keep their nuclear-capable aircraft. Minhas or Kamra, Rafiki, Shehbaz, and Masroor. These are the names of their air bases. Two are in the north and two are in, in the south. And what kind of planes can fire nukes? Two aircraft in Pakistan's arsenal can do the job, the Mirage 3 and the Mirage 5. How many squadrons? At least five. Pakistan has given them special names. Bandits, Heathers, Ghazis, Cobras, and Zarras. Needless to say, all of these bases and garrisons are close to the Indian border for obvious reasons. It also shows that Pakistan has a pretty exhaustive plan to ramp up its nukes. And this should worry the world, not just India, the rest of the world too. Last year, US President Joe Biden spoke about this. He said, and I quote, I think Pakistan is maybe one of the most dangerous nations in the world. Nuclear weapons without any cohesion. That's what he said about Pakistan. Now, Islamabad had called this claim baseless. But soon after that, the entire nation plunged into economic turmoil. The suffering has been immense, but only for the people, not for the Pakistani military. Their assets and budgets keep growing. And now Pakistan's nuclear reserves are on the rise. So here's what we'd like to ask. Is the IMF watching this? How is a country that survives on bailouts being allowed to build these dangerous weapons? 
And how is the world okay with this? Now let's move from Musk to the war he supposedly sabotaged. Ukraine's counteroffensive is still going slow. It hasn't made any significant territorial gains. Now it seems they're shifting focus. Kiev is training its guns on Crimea. This Wednesday, Ukraine hit Crimea with an early morning attack. The target was Sevastopol. It has a strategic shipyard, which is home to Russia's Black Sea Fleet. Ukraine attacked it with 10 cruise missiles and three uncrewed speedboats. Last night, Zelensky hailed the destruction of a Russian air defense system in Crimea. On Monday, Ukraine said it had captured an oil rig near Crimea. So the trajectory is clear. Ukraine is targeting Crimea, the region that Russia captured in 2014. And how is Moscow responding? Looks like Vladimir Putin is turning to his friends. He courted North Korea's Kim Jong-un this week, and now he's met Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko. Here's a report. On Wednesday, cruise missiles rained down on Sevastopol. It's the largest settlement in the Crimean Peninsula, and it contains a crucial Russian naval base. The shipyard in Sevastopol is the home base for Russia's Black Sea Fleet. It's also where the fleet undergoes repairs, so it's essential for Russia's naval dominance in the Black Sea. Ukraine, of course, knows this, which is why it launched an early morning attack on Wednesday. Russia says 10 cruise missiles and three uncrewed boats attacked Sevastopol. In the morning, smoke was seen billowing out of the shipyard. We were woken by a loud noise. My child was woken up as well. It was about 3 a.m. We got very scared. Everything was shaking. That's basically how it was. Satellite imagery showed damage to some vessels under repair. The company that released the images said a landing ship and a submarine were damaged. Russia's defense ministry confirmed that two vessels were hit. But it said that both ships would be fully repaired and returned to service. This wasn't the only attack on Crimea this week. One more thing. A special mention should be made to the entire personnel of the security service of Ukraine as well as our naval forces. I thank you for today's triumph. The invaders' air defense system on the Crimean land was destroyed. Very significant, well done. Glory to all who fight for Ukraine and thanks to everyone who helps. That was Zelensky's address on Thursday night. Ukraine struck Russian air defense systems in the west of Crimea. Russia didn't confirm the destruction, but it said it shot down 11 drones overnight. And these aren't the only recent incidents of Ukrainian operations around Crimea. On Monday, Kyiv released this footage. It shows Ukrainian troops capturing an oil rig. Russia had taken the platform from Ukraine back in 2015, a year after the annexation of Crimea. Ukraine says the platform was being used for military purposes. During inspection, we found unguarded airborne missiles in the engine room. We understood that the enemy used the platform as a warehouse for ammunition. We also found cisterns with petrol. This platform was very important for the enemy. That's where they refueled and kept ammunition. These attacks in and around Crimea come as Ukraine fails to make much headway over land. The counteroffensive that began earlier this year hasn't seen many successes. Some of Ukraine's backers have been getting impatient. The attacks on Crimea could be a way for Ukraine to show progress. Meanwhile, Russian President Vladimir Putin has been meeting his friends. North Korea's Kim Jong-un has been in Russia since Tuesday. They met on Wednesday. Putin was asked if any deal was discussed that breached international sanctions on North Korea. This, I want to emphasize again, is complete nonsense. North Korea is our neighbor and we must, one way or another, build good neighborly relations with our neighbors. Kim is still in the country, visiting an aviation plant in Russia's Far East. Putin, on the other hand, is meeting Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko. During the meeting, Lukashenko suggested a triple alliance between Minsk, Moscow and Pyongyang. How serious that suggestion was remains to be seen. But it's certain that Putin intends to keep Russia's old friends close.
1.5 million. That's how many Indians became engineers or become engineers every year, one and a half million. And today is their day. Every year on 15 September, India celebrates Engineers Day. It is observed on the birth anniversary of M. Vishveshwaraya, a pioneering Indian engineer. He was born in the year 1861. And even today, he's called the builder of India. He once said, we require science, technology, and innovation to transform our country. And he was right. Our engineers have done just that. They've transformed India. They've helped make it the world's fifth largest economy. After all, engineering is central to ensuring economic growth, be it a health or a population issue, or even a problem of food, water, or energy security, engineers play a major role in tackling challenges. They shape every facet of our lives, from the work we do to the homes we live in and the food we eat. That's because engineering is a field that is wonderfully diverse. It can be a rewarding career choice. And India knows this very well. Its love affair with engineering is as well known as its engineers, like Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam, the Missile Man of India, Indian rocket scientist Satish Dhawan, A. Lalita, India's first woman electrical engineer, or Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella. Honestly, the list seems endless. India's engineering system is a success story, and good education has been its lifeline. For many, engineering colleges in India are a gateway to success. India has about 6,000 of them engineering colleges, 6,000, and the most glamorous of them are the IITs, the Indian Institutes of Technology. They're highly coveted. I'll explain why. India has 108 unicorn startups. This is just one example, 108 unicorn startups. 68 of them were founded by IIT alumni. IITians have gone on to lead multinationals like Google CEO Sundar Pichai and Arvind Krishna at IBM. These colleges are an engineering gold mine, so much so that other countries want to replicate them. The government is planning to set up IITs in seven other countries, starting with Tanzania. Now, Indian engineers have gone and found their place in the sun. But today isn't just about applauding them. It's also about understanding their hurdles, their challenges. Engineering is considered a lucrative field, so obviously the competition is fierce all the way. It's difficult to get into an engineering program and almost impossible to crack an elite college. Acceptance rates at the IITs fall well under 5%, meaning if 100 students apply, less than five make it. And even for those who do, life can be tough. The process of becoming an engineer is daunting, it's ruthless. A lot of times students make it to the programs but do not pass. And now fewer students are passing courses. Only 66% of undergrad students pass this year. It's down from 85% last year. And what's next for those who graduate? They face weak job prospects. Between 2014 and 2018, 60%, 6 60% of IIT Bombay graduates took up non-core jobs, meaning they could not find jobs in their own field of study. And this is not just about one college. According to data from the government, almost half of India's engineering undergraduates are unemployable. Almost half. The World Economic Forum says the situation is much worse. According to them, only one in five Indian engineering graduates are employable. One in five, these are terrible odds. And the result is this. Engineering is falling out of favor among students. Between the late 2000s and the early 2010s, India saw an engineering boom. One in four students graduating in science was from India. So about 25% of the world's science graduates were in India during that period. In 2021, about 3.9 million Indians were studying to become engineers. This is a big number. It's more than the population of some countries, 3.9 million, but for India, it's a drop. And this has been the trend in the past decade. In 2015, more than 17% undergrad students were studying engineering. By 2021, the share had dropped to 12%. Look at these numbers. Year on year, the number of student enrollments in engineering are dropping. The number of colleges offering engineering courses have also come down. So it is clear that India's love affair with engineering faces some turbulence. But that is not to say that a breakup lies ahead. Students want to persevere. They want to become nation builders. 1.5 million engineers every year is no small feat, but their journey should not be so hard. They face poor odds of selection, disappointing employability, and challenges from disruptive technology, also a lot of pressure, yet they keep going.
To them, engineering still shines as a beacon of hope. But like most relationships, there must be give and take. Let's just say engineering needs its mojo back. And now it's time for Vantage Shorts images that tell the story. Looks like Kim Jong-un lived his top gun dreams in Russia. The North Korean leader was seen sitting in the cockpit of a fighter jet. In the United States, a new video shows airport staff stealing from bags. So next time, remember to get some padlocks for your luggage. And Northern, the Northern Lights put on a dazzling show over the Scottish Islands, lighting up the, the night sky. Finally, we're taking you back in history. On this day in 1978, Muhammad Ali won the world heavyweight boxing title for the third time, becoming the first boxer ever to do so. Just a year after that, Ali announced that he was retiring, but finally left the sport in 1981. We're leaving you on that note. Thank you for watching. Have a good weekend.